So we are in Matthew chapter six today, and it's the final part of Matthew chapter six. Although if you look at it, there are several almost like mini sermons within this Sermon on the Mount. So you could take them apart bit by bit. And we start with um, verse 19 today. And um, I just pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us, minister to each and every one of us who are here today, open up the word of God to us, lead us and direct us by the Holy Spirit, whom we depend upon as our teacher. Lead us and guide us into all truth so that Jesus will be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, if it's on the screen, it will say, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Can you imagine? That's a, like a little mini sermon on itself, isn't it? So it's just amazing how when we look at that, what's this got to do with? Well, we have to remember, these are not just, you know, pulled out of anywhere. This is part of an overall message we call the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the key verses for the Sermon on the Mount was back in Matthew 5, 20, where it says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's to do with the standard that is expected of the believer. So as believers, we are held to higher standards than everyone else, right? And so he said, look, for those who are my disciples, you shouldn't be thinking about things on this earth as like, how much can I gather? How much can I possess on this earth? Your focus should be higher than that, shouldn't it? That you should be saying, hey, I'm not laying up, I'm not trying to gather up as much as I can on this earth. Why? Well, um, because he says there, where there's going to be um, moth and rust destroy and thieves break in the steel. You're always concerned about those things. And uh, what, what's going to happen? I don't know if you have any moth-eaten clothes or if you have any rust-eaten bicycles or rust-eaten uh, things, but that's the sort of thing. It, it literally means something that eats up. It's eating away at your stuff, and that can happen to all of your possessions that you've been trying to gather up on earth, whatever they might be. And he said, "Look, you shouldn't be concerned about the things in the servant. Don't try to gather." Which surprises me, actually, when I read those verses. How we do hear of preachers? How many have heard preachers where it's talking about how you can be so prosperous and so blessed, and how many cars you can have, how many houses they have, how many jet airplanes they've got? It's as if they haven't read these verses at all. It is they have amassed so much wealth on earth; it's unbelievable. Is that the way it should be for the disciples? See how much you can prove to everyone how prosperous and blessed you are by how much you can possess on this earth. That shouldn't be the way of the disciple. And besides that, when you've got all of those things, wouldn't you be constantly concerned about what's going to happen with my stuff? Maybe it's going to get destroyed. Maybe it's going to get worn out. And maybe some thief is going to be robbing my stuff. How's that? You know, that shouldn't be the case for the believer because he says, I'm not concerned too much about the things on this earth. My focus is on the things in heaven. He says, what? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How many of you can say, I have treasure in heaven Amen. i don't know what it is but there is something we're going to look at in a moment don't lay up for yourselves treasures in uh, on earth but treasures in heaven where moth nor rust where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break and steal thank god that we have security in heaven there's nothing going to happen to our stuff there whatever it might be it's there's no thieves coming in there whatever it is and one of the scriptures that i want to refer to is First Peter chapter one. How many are familiar with that verse? We're at talk or these verses. First Peter chapter one and um, verses three to five, where we read. I'll find a first course and it might be on the screen. I don't know if he's able to get that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you is that yours yeah 
who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Thank God, whatever I've got in heaven, and it's, it's, it is secure, thank God that I have a place in heaven, but also that I'm going there, and my reservation has been made, listen, listen to that again, a living hope through the resurrection of the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Think about it. It's like there's a your name is written on it. It's reserved your place. Have you ever been into it, come into a room and you saw all the seats had reserve written on them? Yeah, something's reserved for someone else. That's exactly what has been in, uh, stored for you in heaven. Praise God. So why is that? Well, some people, you know, and how many have heard the statement? Some people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly use. Ever heard that before? It's not actually true, but if you do think about heavenly things, you know, you're not thinking about too much about things on this earth. It's we do have to live on this earth, but we're not consumed by that and just constantly focusing, focusing on what we can get on earth. It says here, um, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your heart at? Now, I'll ask you this question. Are you constantly thinking about heaven all the time? I don't think most of us are saying that's all I think about every day, all the time. But that's where your heart is. That's where you want to be. You want to be where the things of God are. And so, therefore, you're not so focused, so holding on to the things of this earth that you can't let go of it. Isn't that the way the Christian should be? Right. So that's the way of his disciples. Okay. And then we'll read on a bit more from this. We read then. And verses 22 to 20, 23, because this is not the easiest little section but again a little mini sermon in itself the lamp of the body is the eye if therefore your eye is good your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if therefore the light that is in you is darkness how great is that darkness have you ever read those verses and wondered what is he talking about like how on earth is our eye like a lamp hmm? ever thought about that like i have a hat i got for christmas i think i might have brought with me today with a with a light on here and it looks like you know it's it's a, a big eye or something like that but it's just a lamp basically the whole idea is to give me light where i'm going on the pathway and that's the whole point if your eye is good you're going to be able to see and you're able to see the path that you're on you're not going to stumble but if your eye is bad well the whole point is that you may stumble now we're supposed to be people who've got good eyes now the question is what does he mean when he says here the eye of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is good, you can have a good eye or a bad eye. Now, and that could talk about natural vision. How many need glasses? I can't see those hands. Right. Okay. Okay. You need glasses, but, but that's not to say your, your eyes are bad. But what does it mean to have a good eye or a bad eye? Really? Um, you'd have to go back to some Old Testament uh, texts and some New Testament ones. For example, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 15. And um, it's just by looking at these verses, you might get an idea of what it means. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9 says this. And uh, it's hard to see it, actually. But so close. Yeah, without glasses. Yeah, but I, I've, lo I've lo long sight, I think. Uh, Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying... The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye is be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. Uh, you shall give to him, and your heart shall should not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your weeks and in all which you uh, put your hand for the poor will never cease from the land. The whole idea there is to have an evil eye is to say, say I'm going to be stingy. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to be generous to the person. Okay, that's the idea. Also in Proverbs chapter 22, uh, verse 9. Let's find that. It says, He who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives of his bread to the poor. It is somebody who is generous, sees the needs of people and says, I want to give to them. I want to be a blessing to those people. That's someone who has a good eye. Okay. And in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 20, you remember the uh, parable Jesus gave, Matthew chapter 20 and verse, it's about the people working in the field. And 
I suppose from verse 14, take what is yours and, and, and go your way. I wish to give to the last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Uh, for many are called, but few are chosen. The whole idea there is this man in the parable wanted to be good, wanted to be generous. He had a good eye and uh, they had an evil eye toward people, which was they didn't want to do that. So he said that all of his disciples, Jesus is saying that that's the way we should be as disciples. Be people who are generous, people who are giving, because if that's the case, well, you're going to be filled with the light and the life of God, isn't this? But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of the darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? How many of you want to be filled with light and the love of God toward people and not full of darkness? Well, that's the way every believer should be. Now, in connection with all of these things, just to show the whole, how it all connects together, verse 24, another verse on its own, and probably you've heard this quoted many times. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. How many are familiar with that verse? Heard it many times yeah, preached. Yeah. Okay, praise God for it. But in, in, a, in a time whenever people were well familiar with the whole idea of masters and servants, and in fact, the word there is the whole idea of being a slave, that there was a lot of slaves in the running around, uh, there was more slaves than, than, than just free people, it seems, everywhere you find slaves, and he says, but the, a slave can only be owned by one master, and if, have, ever, have you ever worked for a, a, a bosses and been told to, what to do by two different people, and you said, who am I supposed to follow, this guy or that guy, and you can't serve two masters, you can't be giving instructions by two different people and expected to know what to do, and and he says, that's the way it's going to be when it comes to the people of God. You can only serve one or the other. And he says, here's the, here's the, the main reference. He said, you'll either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Now, the best example here is you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, if I was to ask the question, and who is mammon? What would your answer be? Money. Huh? Money. Money. Okay. Love of, money. love of money. Very nice. Okay. And that's the most common answer that money. And of course, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? But in actual fact, it's more than just money. It is your possessions, everything, and which ties in with everything that has been said so far, that you're not holding on to the things of this earth, my possessions. So it's not just about money. It is your possessions. But is it wrong to have possessions? No. Not at all. In fact, I have a reference here from the, now this is from the Palestinian Targum. That just means it's a translation of the Bible from somewhere, and we don't normally read this one, but I just looked it up. De Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, in the Palestinian Targum, it says, honor the Lord with your possessions, and no, that's not the one. You shall love, you shall love Yahweh your God with all your mammon, which is an interesting translation of the word, um, what we normally say, with all your heart, soul, mind, everything you've got, basically. But another verse which ties that up is Proverbs 3, 9. How many are familiar with Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9? In relation to this, you've probably heard it several times as well. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says that we are to honor God with what? Honor the Lord with your possessions, which would be mammon. Okay, and with the first fruits of all your increase, mm -hmm. so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So he's not saying, and I don't want you to have anything at all. It's just that what you're supposed to do with all that you've got, all of your possessions, is that you don't cling on to them as if I've got to see how much I can get and mount up all I can get for my own benefit, for my own sake, but it's so that you can honor God and Show God, well, look, I'm going to use these for your honor and for your glory and, and for the things of God. That's where my focus is. How about, how about investing in the things of God and saying, I'm going to invest in heaven and to get people to get to heaven, which means I want to see the gospel going out into all the world. That I, I'm not focused so much on this world. 
So we can honor God. And he said he will do something with our, if we will honor God. Now, this is not turning it into a prosperity message, which some people would do at this point. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. God can expect that from us. How many of you can expect that? I will see increase in my life. Amen. Amen. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats overflow with new wine. That is definitely a sign of prospering. Amen. But it's what we do with it is what matters. And he says, but if you're, if you're in that verse 24, Matthew 6, 24, if all you're doing is, is clinging on to your possessions, you're going to either love one, that is love your possessions and hate God, you can be loyal to the one and despise the other. And we don't want to be people who despise God and love our possessions. We want to love God first and everything will fall into place. Amen. Now, that's the half of that whole chapter done almost, except for one last section. And this is, I love this section because the whole emphasis is on do not worry. Imagine that you'd have to find that in the Bible. And it's said several times. So I have to suggest there may be some people who are worriers amongst us. Are there anyone who suffers from a little bit of worrying, anxiety, fear, that kind of thing from time to time? Well, listen to this. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither, talk, they neither sow, sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Okay, so... Why did Jesus say, do not worry? I mean, he said it right there in verse 25. Therefore, so it's based upon everything we've just talked about so far. All the things in that chapter, all the things in the previous verses, he says, therefore, based on all of that, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now, there are people who literally worry about every little thing, aren't there? Yeah. But he says, don't worry about your life. And so what does that include when you talk about your life? I'm worried about my life. What does it mean? What you will eat. What are you going to eat? <clears throat> what you will drink. Nor about your body, what you will put on. So you know what? It's amazing when I read that because I don't think we're too worried about what we're, what we're going to eat. It's maybe there's so much choice. I'm worried. What will I, what will I, I can't decide what, what I'm going to eat. That's more like it, isn't it? There's such a variety. And I mean, to drink, there's such a variety of things I could choose from. But when it comes to clothing, oh, I don't, I'm, can you imagine someone so worried that they don't know what they're going to put on? Because they said, will I look my best? Will I have the best clothes on today? Had I, have I worn this shirt before? Oh, what if people see me wearing the same thing? There's people worry about that kind of thing. It's crazy, isn't it? We shouldn't be thinking like that. You can wear the same shirt twice. Man, you can wear your socks more than one day in a row, okay? Just in case there are people who, I mean, we got new stuff at Christmas anyway, right? I mean, who got socks? I got socks. Socks, shirts, jumpers, shoes. And even if you didn't get anything for Christmas, you went and bought yourself something in the sales or whatever. So the point is that there's no need for us to worry. But these people at this time, do you know what? They probably didn't know where their next food, their next meal was coming from, what they were going to eat or drink that day. And they had no real wardrobe of clothes. They had maybe had the shirt on their backs and a few other possessions and not very much. OK, so he says, don't worry about those things, especially as disciples. Remember, this is going back to Matthew 520, a higher standard of righteousness. You who are disciples, you're not to worry about these sort of things. For I'll give you an example, he says, um, life is more than all of that. Look at the birds. This is now uh, Jesus encouraging bird watching. OK, now look at the birds of the air. So you can go out and say, oh, I'm just doing what Jesus said to do. I'm going out looking at the birds. OK, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your fa heavenly father feeds them. Now, before you go any further, that's not to suggest that birds just sit in their nests and sit there all day thinking, When's the worm going to drop into my nest? When's it coming? By drone, by, by home delivery. I'm waiting for the father to provide. 
Is that what we're supposed to be doing as uh, believers? Well, I'm just waiting. You know, God will provide. Birds don't just sit there, do they? What do they do? You find them, they go out, they hunt, and they find the food. And if we would go out and hunt for a job, look for something to do, God will provide. But we can't be saying, oh, I'm just waiting for God to do it all. No, he's not saying that at all. He says, you go and look at the birds. They are actively involved. God will always provide and lead them. Okay. Your heavenly father, he looks after them. They don't, they, um, they neither sow nor gather in, in the barns like farmers do and that sort of thing. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Well, let me ask you this. How much are birds worth? In those days, you could buy a couple of sparrows for a couple of pence. How much are you worth? You're worth much more than birds. And it wasn't just sparrows. He says birds. And if you look it up in the, apparently in the original languages, it says, it's, and if you look up in the NIV translation as well, it talks about ravens and crows. So look at the birds, the ravens and the crows. Did you know that the ravens and the crows, according to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 15, and Deuteronomy 14, 14, they are unclean birds, which if that's the case, and God provides for the unclean birds, that is ceremonially unclean according to the law. If he will provide for those type of birds, then how much more will he provide for his own children? So the question is then, uh, if that's the case, um, are you not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Now, if I was to ask you, what does that mean, adding a cubit to your stature? A cubit is supposed to be from the tip of the finger here to the elbow. Is he saying that you could, you can, you can grow? Maybe he could be, talk, could be talking about a little kid saying, "You'll grow up one day." I don't think so. Because if you look at it up in some other translations, such as the NIV, it's saying, which of you can add one, a single R to his life? A single R. So if you're talking about worrying, will worrying add any time to your life? No, I don't think so. But how many of you think that it may actually take time off of your life? And could, worrying doesn't help you in any way. It's not good for your health, is it? And it could actually cause you to uh, be crippling yourself in some way. And not and just in case you're wondering, well, what, what are you talking about? Length of time uh, measured by cubits? Well, over in Psalm 39, we should just turn there. Psalm 39, verses 4 to 5. Interesting verse. If I can just find it. These are really good. Uh, we read this. It says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best state is but a vapor. We've looked at that several times as well. You know, how do you measure even by handbreadths? how your life is and you can add or take away from your life but worrying is certainly not going to add to your life is it so he says there why do you worry i mean there's a point in all of this what we're getting to okay so we'll read on matthew chapter 6 verse 28 so he goes again so why do you worry why do you worry about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow now, you're, you're encouraged to do a bit of nature study here. Go and look at the birds. Now, go and look at the lilies of the field, not just lilies. The word literally is all kinds of growth in the wild, whether it be lilies, weeds, or grass. So, you go and consider how these things grow in the field, lilies grow in the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. In other words, they don't manufacture stuff. And yet, I say to you that Solomon, how many have read about Solomon in the Old Testament and thought, why am I reading all this? And the way he was dressed and all of his glory and all of it, all the revenue that he had, all of those things. And yet he says, I say to you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these in all the brightest colors of the day. And yet, you know, when God, when you look out on the fields where 
Nobody even lives in some of these places. Yet there are some vivid colors, aren't there? And some wild flowers and some pretty things. And yet all of that is an expression of God's extravagance in creation. God has just made so many beautiful things. And yet what happens? He says, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which that's why it's not just lilies, the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Well, the reason that's because what people did is they took the weeds, that was dead weeds, dead grass, dead flowers, threw it into the oven as a means of fuel. So he says, well, if it's today is, and it's tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now I know, uh, there's a reason behind this. He's saying, look, I want you who are believers not to be of small or little faith. You've got to trust God that he will provide for you, whether it's your food or your drink or your clothing. Why worry? Why do you worry, oh, you of little faith? And he told his disciples off on many occasions for having a little faith. But the real reason is this, is because why do you, if I was to ask you this question, why do you worry? Why do you worry? Think about it. Why do you worry? Because maybe you don't think that God actually is sovereign and that God is in control and that God's providence covers you as well. Because if you did, you'd say, God's looking after me. Everything I wear. I mean, how many of you give thanks on a regular basis for the clothes you wear, for a hot shower, perhaps, or for a bed that you slept in, for all the many things that God has provided for your life? And why do you, what is there to worry about? And if you're eaten up with worry, why do you worry? He asked this several times. And again, verse 31. Therefore, do not worry. Is that a suggestion? It's a command, isn't it? Do not worry, saying, and sometimes we say it out of our mind, we just keep blurting it out. We say it, these words, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Well, he says, that's the way you shouldn't be because that, according to verse 32, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Now, are we Gentiles? We, we are Gentiles who become Christians, therefore we're Christians, right? But he's talking about Gentiles in a different sense here because Gentiles, if you look it up in the, NIV, it is pagans. And if you look it up in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it is the idolaters. So the idea is people who don't know God. That's people who don't believe in God, who don't trust God, who are not followers of Jesus Christ. That means that those people are so consumed with things of this world, they've got to try to get what they can and gather stuff together because they're worried about what will I have for tomorrow? What will I have to eat? What will I have to drink? What will I wear? I got to gather as much as I can together. Someone gave an illustration, which I thought was pretty good. Let me just... Uh, find that and i'm going to try and fit it in here it may not exactly fit the materialistic world is like a group of passengers frantically scurrying to get the best deck chair on a sinking ship think about that can you imagine people doing oh the, the titanic sinking right so meanwhile right we'll we'll have to see if we can get a good seat right here it's just silly okay so everything's going down everything's falling apart, and these people are trying to gather as much as they can together. That's not the way it should be for the disciples, who is saying, I'm not focused on this world. My future is ahead. I'm, I'm looking to heaven and the, the things of heaven, and I look forward to what I'm going to do, enjoy there with God and with all the people I can bring with me. I can't bring anyone with me to uh, anywhere else. I can't, take, I, can't take, I can't take anything with me, in other words, except people to heaven. Isn't that right? I got to bring the gospel to people, show them the way of salvation, tell them the truth, and um, point them to the Savior. Amen. So he says this For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your Heavenly Father. Now, every time I mention about the Heavenly Father, we have to make it a, a, a point. Not everyone can claim God as their Heavenly Father. Now, I don't know how many people have, have read this and thought, well, yeah, our Heavenly Father, but he's not your Heavenly Father. Until you're born of the Spirit of God, yeah. until you've been born again, you are not able to call God your Heavenly Father. Only those who truly know God can say that. Amen? Yeah. So I remember reading things like when I became a Christian, or even before I was a Christian, I was thinking, can I really say the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. 
And I realized, well, only when I can actually say I'm one of his can I say that he's my shepherd or he's my father. And, you know, we have to be born again. And, of course, those who have been born again, they come to a place of repentance and faith and put their trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done for them on the cross. So that's him and his disciples. So he says here, for all these things you're, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. God is not against you having the things that you need, such as the food you eat, the drink, the, the um, clothes you wear, all that sort of He's not against that. He knows that you need all these things. But what are you to do? Verse 33, one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Thank God for that verse, because that is what our folk, I mean, there are a lot of people in this world, that's not their focus, is it? They're not saying, oh, that's my number one priority. I've got to know God and his righteousness. And by the way, it's probably not talking about justification here, because um, if it was, you know, that is true. We need to have the justification, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We need that or never going to enter heaven. But back in th Matthew 5, 20, he says that your righteousness is of a higher standard. And that's what we need to be seeking after as disciples. How can I live in a way that is pleasing to God and a higher level of righteousness? Seek that, that you want to live like that. And... What? Seek first the kingdom of God, and make sure you're entering in there first, and his righteousness, and all of these things will what? Be added to you. You know, God has ways of bringing it into your life. So again, there's no need to worry. And finally, why does he emphasize it so many times? Verse 34, the last verse of this chapter, therefore, do not worry. How many times are you going to have to say it? Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, if you've got a King James version of the Bible, you may have read that it says this, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, there's so much evil going around, and there'll be more of that tomorrow. But every other translation, I think almost every one of them says the word is trouble there could be trouble ahead how many of you know that yeah i don't know what tomorrow brings god does i don't have to worry about it but by worrying what am i saying i can't i can only trust god and i don't know what you know will he look will he also take care of me tomorrow i mean we should be in a place where we can say god is in control of every day past present and future i don't have to worry or be anxious about anything and why should i heap upon today the worries and the troubles of tomorrow by even thinking about it and scared and being anxious and saying i don't know what tomorrow will bring how many of you trust that god is sovereign and is in control of every detail of your life and therefore i mean that's the overall picture i get from this chapter by the way and that is this i trust in the sovereignty of god i trust in the providence of god and i believe that there's nothing that happens by accident every detail of our lives is covered by god's plan and his sovereignty our salvation our provision every single thing therefore there's absolutely you get this through into your heads okay and that's me as well do not worry there's no need to be anxious at all because all you're doing is by doing that is saying, I do not trust God and his ability to look after my life. Amen. I'm going to close there. And I was going to ask Nympha because she had a song that she had been practicing and she was going to come and bring that song. If someone could just grab her from wherever she is. Shepherds here. Amen. If you need prayer today, say, for example, you're saying, Well, I don't know. I worry so much. And I maybe I don't have as much faith as I should have. You need to go back to look at the things to do with the, the God's sovereignty from cover to cover in the Bible. That God takes special care of his people. If he cares for birds, and he cares for weeds, right? Surely he takes care of his own children. Amen?